um, which implies an approach, but any approach rests upon a, a myriad of questions and complexities and unresolved uh, matters and great deal of speculation. Now, very few people will be as able to discuss the fundamentals of the situation in Iraq and our policy there as, as our guest this evening. Ambassador Satterfield is a career Foreign Service officer. He's a, he was born in Baltimore, educated at the University of Maryland, law degree from Georgetown. He's been in the State Department since 1980. His early postings included uh, Jeddah in Tunis, Beirut, Damascus. His later assignments included uh, serving on the National Security Council as uh, the Director of Near Eastern and South Asian Affairs. He worked as a research uh, analyst in the, uh, the uh, uh, Bureau of Intelligence and Research both before and after that. He served as the Director of the uh, Office of Israeli and Arab-Israeli Relations or Affairs uh, in the State Department. And after that assignment became our ambassador to Lebanon from 1998 to 2001, at an even more tender age than he presently enjoys. The, uh, he was Deputy uh, Assistant Secretary of State in the Bureau of Near Eastern and, and uh, uh, South Asian Affairs uh, in the early part of the, the, the decade, and he was the Principal Deputy from 2004 to 2005. He then became our Deputy Chief of Mission, number two man in the Embassy in Baghdad. And from there he came back to Washington, where he's been the Special Advisor to the Secretary of State and also the Director of the uh, uh, Office, uh, or, or Director on the question of Iraq. So his experience is extraordinary. It's deeply uh, uh, centered in the, the Middle East. I should note he's received almost a dozen distinctive awards in the Department of State, especially for his work on the Middle East peace process. And so as we, with some puzzlement, curiosity, and interest, try to appraise what we're doing in Iraq, very few people bring the depth of knowledge and the interest in the subject that our guest does this evening. It's a great pleasure to present Ambassador Satterfield. Thank you all. It is always a pleasure to come back to Baltimore and have an opportunity to speak here. This is either the third or the fourth time, I believe, over the last several years that I've had this honor. This is really an exceptional forum, and it brings together individuals who both have an interest in foreign affairs and whose views very much do impact uh, the community and indeed ought to impact us as we sit in Washington and attempt to determine a way forward. So I'm going to try to keep my remarks relatively brief to allow a maximum time for your questions and answers. Uh, but before I begin, I have to acknowledge the presence in this room of someone quite special without whom I would not be here, quite literally. My mother, Betty Kemp, is here in the front row. And while she may wish I had taken a different career direction somewhere along the lines other than Baghdad, Beirut, Damascus, <laughs> things are as they are. I'm going to start this presentation of the way ahead in Iraq uh, by doing something that may appear rather paradoxical. I'm not going to start with a discussion of Iraq. I'm going to start with a discussion of what are the enduring U.S. interests, what are the enduring challenges the United States faces, not in Iraq, but in the Middle East as a whole. This is a critical region of the world. It is the source of the majority of the hydrocarbon imports for the United States and most of our partners around the world. It is an area whose conflicts affect our lives and have affected our lives for much of the last half century. It is an area where stability, security, where a progressive evolutionary process of democratization, by which I mean not a capital D democratization that one can characterize and categorize or apply a single model to, but the progressive expansion of opportunities for participation for the citizens of that region and its states in the social, political, and economic life of their countries, 
where that process is of importance to us, where the confrontation with forces of radicalism, violence, terror, and extremism, whether homegrown and indigenous to that region or international, as is the case with Al-Qaeda, is of great immediate importance to all Americans, to indeed the international community. For 60 years, the United States has been present in a civilian and in a military fashion in the Middle East. It is an enduring, significant part of our foreign policy in the world today, and it will remain a part of our foreign policy for the indefinite future. Because the interests we have in this region, the consequences to us here in the United States, as well as to our friends and allies around the world, if that region follows a course in the direction of greater instability, greater violence, greater polarization, so significant, we believe that it would be irresponsible for any U.S. administration to change the course followed by all presidents since Franklin Roosevelt met in 1945 in the Great Bitter Lake uh, with King Abdulaziz of Saudi Arabia and pull out, depart, precipitously withdraw. Now that's a discussion of the broad Middle East, the interests we face there. But let's take the lens back a step further and look to global interests that project from the Middle East. The United States has a compelling interest in halting the proliferation of weapons, of technologies, of mass destruction, especially nuclear weapons. Iran is today pursuing nuclear weapons. It has the delivery vehicles for such weapons. Iran is a threat. It's a threat not just to the Middle East, not just to the United States. It's a threat to the world, to the peace of the international community. And as we look at the Middle East as a whole, we must look at the strategic level of challenge that reaches beyond that area to the world. Now, I will pull the lens back in and consider Iraq. In Iraq, these lines I've just discussed, security, stability, the confrontation with radicalism, polarization, violence, extremism, Iran's challenge to the peace of the world as well as the stability of the region, Al-Qaeda's challenge to the peace of the world, the stability of the region, all intersect. Iraq becomes important not simply because, and I would say perhaps least due to Iraq's own equities, but it is what Iraq, its progress, its development represents for the United States in terms of these broader challenges, broader interests, that what happens there in that troubled country becomes so important, not just for today, but for the future to the United States. The way ahead in Iraq. The price of our engagement in Iraq has been extraordinarily dear, extraordinarily high. Over 3,700 American men and women killed, almost 30,000 wounded, some grievously and for life. Tens of thousands of Iraqis dead, tens of thousands more wounded and millions displaced internally or as refugees in Syria and Jordan primarily. What is to be done? Does Iraq truly represent, as a recent documentary film has it, a war without end? Does it represent some sink of foreign policy of American life and treasure that cannot be redeemed? Well, when Ambassador Crocker and Commanding General Petraeus spoke on exactly this subject to the American Congress uh, in mid-September, what they laid out was a very frank, a very honest, a very realistic assessment of the magnitude of the challenges posed today in Iraq. But they also outlined something else, how an approach which we have adopted over the course of this year has altered many of the very negative trends, many of the very negative projections that would have been the consistent partner of any assessment of Iraq during all of 2005, accelerating during 2006. The situation in Iraq is changing. But I want to explain to you how it's changing, how it is not changing, and how we view this as impacting upon the presence of our men and women 
in the country. The ability of the United States over time to achieve objectives in Iraq and through Iraq and the region as a whole that are important to us in addressing these enduring interests that I spoke of at the beginning of my speech. What's happening in Iraq? Well, the first thing that is happening in Iraq is a quite extraordinary diminution in the levels of violence. No matter how one parses the metrics, as the military likes to refer to them, numbers of attacks, casualties from the attacks, in Baghdad, outside Baghdad, from sectarian sources of violence, Shia militias, Sunni militias, from Al-Qaeda terror, suicide bombings, or from the so-called Sunni insurgency. The violence is down, it's down dramatically. It's dropping at an ever more precipitate rate throughout the country. Now, this is very good, but why is it happening? What's responsible for this? What does it mean for the future? What we're seeing is the convergence in Iraq of many lines of operation, of many engagements which the United States, civilian and military alike, have been making, along with our coalition partners and along with Iraqis, over the course of the last year and a half. Let's take a look back a year ago at where Iraq and we were. It was an absolutely miserable situation. Sectarian violence was producing hundreds of dead alone in Baghdad per day, thousands per week. Anbar province, to the west of Baghdad, a Sunni area, was famously described by a Marine Lieutenant Colonel intelligence analyst as lost, irredeemably lost, lost to Al-Qaeda, lost to violence, lost to terror. Baghdad was spinning ever more rapidly into sectarian violence, sectarian polarization, segregation of neighborhoods, forced expulsions, flight of communities from their homes. The government appeared absolutely unable or unwilling to take any steps to confront this. Iranian intervention, interference in Iraqi affairs ever more increasing. This was the picture of Iraq. Well, we took a look at this. We spent much of the fall assessing what was to be done because the stakes of success or failure in Iraq were, and we projected, would be so high. And what we determined was, above all, security for the population of Baghdad, its surrounding areas, had to be assured. Had to be assured through a greater application of U.S. forces and a greater application of Iraqi forces. Why Baghdad? Because Baghdad is the political center of the country. It's the center of gravity for the country. It's the place where the concept of an Iraq, as opposed to many Iraqs, a unified state, either succeeds or it fails. It wasn't reasonable to expect any government of Iraq, however motivated, to be able to take progress on the painful existential issues that confront that country against this background of ever-increasing sectarian polarization, death, violence, displacement of communities. So this became our focus. The President committed five brigades, almost 30,000 U.S. forces, primarily to focus on stabilizing the situation in Baghdad. Now that surge, as it is famously called, of U.S. forces only reached its full tempo in June, July, August of this year. But the progressive impact of that surge was being felt from the first moment we began bringing forces in. Over the last year, over the last nine months in particular, over the last four months especially, we have seen this progressive and sustained diminution in violence, in sectarian violence, in insurgent violence, in al-Qaeda violence progress. What else is responsible for this? Well, something rather extraordinary happened in Anbar province, that area that had been lost to al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda's heavy-handed control of this Sunni community finally produced Sunni rebellion. We helped facilitate, but we were not the party responsible for the flip of the population of Anbar away from fighting us away from killing Iraqi government forces to killing al-Qaeda. They decided they'd had enough. They'd had enough with decapitations, beheading of children and infants as signs of intimidation, of domination of the lifestyles of this very traditional Sunni province. And they rebelled. They rebelled against al-Qaeda. And al-Qaeda, while not defeated, and I want to be very careful about this, al-Qaeda remains a potent, 
lethal force in Iraq as elsewhere, but it has been diminished significantly through the actions that have taken place in Anbar and beyond Anbar. What happened the moment Al-Qaeda was put on its back foot, was taken out of a position of dominance, is that stability and security came back to Anbar for the first time in four years. In Ramadi, a city in Anbar which to me looked the closest to wartime Green Line Beirut, an absolutely extraordinary scene of desolation, devastation from fighting, and absolute threat and fear, is now a place where school children play in the streets, where the rubble of the last three years is being torn down and reconstruction is taking place. Anbar today, the lost province of only a year ago, is now one of the safest and most secure places in Iraq. But it isn't just secure and it isn't just safe in a security standpoint. Something else rather extraordinary happened. The moment the security situation stabilized in Anbar, local government came back. Mayors, a provincial council who had been exiled in Baghdad for up to three years, returned to their offices. And they didn't just come back to their offices. They came back with plans, with plans for what their communities needed, for what they needed from the central government. Did this just happen out of the blue? No. It happened because we, at a civilian and military sense, had been working with these same leaders in their exile in Baghdad, with local citizens on the ground during the worst days and months and years of Anbar's suffering. Because we have been able to deploy our brigade combat teams, their associated provincial reconstruction teams, which pool with our military, civilian advisors, civilian development experts, political experts, economic specialists, under the direction of the Department of State, because we've conjoined our civilian efforts with the military's efforts, we were ready. We were prepared to work with local government when it could resume its work. But we also have been working over the last two difficult years with the central government in Baghdad. And above all, we've been working with them on mobilization of their ability to spend their money, provide their services for their citizens. Look, Iraq is a unique case. I can think of no other instance in the world where so much U.S. treasure has been invested in a country which is as liquid as Iraq is in terms of its treasury accounts. The problem was not that Iraq did not have money. It does. It did. It was literally incapable of spending its money. This was a government that could not move money out of its capital investment budget into profit-generating enterprises. It did not have the ability to spend. So we focused on this. I can tell you, you can't go to the Congress with a state that has just had a $12 billion profit from oil prices and ask for multiple billions of dollars in U.S. economic assistance more than once or maybe twice. You don't get a favorable reception. We know that. The Congress has made very clear to us it knows that. And we've made clear to the Iraqis they must fund their own development as a nation. We have invested over $22 billion in economic support for Iraq. But that investment is coming to a close. It is being now spent through. It's in its final stages now. And it's Iraqi performance, Iraqi budget execution that's going to be critical for the future. And so that's where we'd focused for two years in training ministries how to move budgets, how to construct budgets, how to practically get money from one place to another. And when Anbar came back, the central government was ready to provide funding, and it did, some $220 million, either delivered or pledged to Anbar, for projects which our own efforts in Anbar helped provide local governments the capacity, the mechanisms to decide upon, to present to the national government for development. Something else extraordinary happened in Anbar. Those individuals who had been killing coalition forces, U.S. forces, killing Iraqi forces, now are applying for entry into Iraq's security forces. Not just the police, which doesn't move from the province where they're recruited, but the National Army, which can be deployed anywhere. Now, all this is happening against a backdrop that I think everyone in this room knows and sees and hears a very little action coming at the grand level of the national government making progress on issues like a hydrocarbon law, 
a debathification reform law, constitutional revisions. These measures have been stalled for many months, in some cases, for years. And progress on them remains exceptionally difficult. But what happened in Anbar shows that at a practical, pragmatic, bottom-up level, you can get the same progress, or much of the same progress, you're seeking through national laws by practical steps and accommodations at a local level, hard work at the ministerial level with the national government, and then bridge building between the two. Does all of this mean that Iraq through a back door is reconciling? No. That is not what is happening yet. It does need to happen, as in any post-conflict state. True national reconciliation ultimately is a sine qua non. That hasn't happened in Iraq yet. Something else, though, is happening. Greater stability, greater security for populations in more and more places. A better ability of local governance to deliver services to local populations. A better ability of the national government to deliver services and funding to provincial government. This is what is happening on the ground. There's no debathification reform law. Too many people who had no criminal responsibility for the events of Saddam's regime, no individual responsibility, are still excluded from national life. There does ultimately need to be a good national reform of debathification. But at a practical level, what Dave Petraeus calls local amnesty or local immunity is taking place, and it has the same impact. People who previously felt excluded from national life and were violently confronting the new government of Iraq are now seeking entry into that government. That is an important step. But as we look at the future, as we look at the way ahead, more has to be done. Ryan Crocker and Dave Petraeus are going to be back before the Congress and the American people in March of this year, of next year, rather. When they come back in March, they can't talk about ANBAR, important as ANBAR is. They're going to have to be able to speak to what's happening elsewhere in the country. What's happening in mixed community areas around Baghdad and outside, where a Shia-dominated central government has to take steps to empower Sunnis who don't just live in an all-Sunni community like Anbar, but live side by side with Shia. That's a real challenge. It's very difficult. And right now, that's where our efforts are focused. That's where we're focusing the efforts of our Iraqi partners. Big challenge out there. There are no guarantees. We have seen violence, as I noted at the beginning, diminish. Will it continue to diminish as our forces draw down? Dave Petraeus would not have recommended, and the President would not have approved, the drawdown months ahead of the needed date of five U.S. brigades and two Marine battalions. Had they not been convinced that Iraqi forces were capable of replacing ours, of taking the lead in an increasingly stabilized Iraq. But can that process continue? That's what we will be examining and following closely over the months ahead as these brigades actually depart. And based upon General Petraeus's, Ryan Crocker's assessment presented to the President of what we then can do will come other recommendations of further steps that may be taken, always based as based in the past on circumstances on the ground. That will determine where our force levels are, what the posture of our forces may be, and the rate at which a continued withdrawal can and will take place. But we are encouraged by the developments we have seen over the past nine months. Now, Al-Qaeda. We've talked about the Sunni insurgency and how they have turned against, increasingly, Al-Qaeda. We've talked about how they are seeking entry into the government security forces, and tentative steps are being made with our encouragement by the central government to reach out to them. But al-Qaeda attacks are down everywhere. Is this just the product of Anbar? I think it is significantly the product of what has happened in Anbar, the denial of safe haven there. But it's also the product of a relentlessly aggressive campaign by U.S. forces in Iraq to address the threat posed by al-Qaeda as vigorously as we can, but Al-Qaeda is not a spent force, and it is way premature to declare victory over Al-Qaeda. But the tide of the battle, I believe, has been turned, but it is a battle which will definitely continue within Iraq and outside. Now, I use terms like will continue, progressive progress being made on the ground. What does this mean about the future of the American presence, military and civilian, in Iraq? It means that because our challenges in the Middle East are enduring and long-term,
because our interests in the Middle East are enduring and long-term, because those interests in many cases intersect in and through Iraq. Our presence in Iraq, our significant presence in Iraq also, needs to be one that reflects the long-term and enduring nature of the threat and of the need to remain engaged in challenging and responding to that threat. We hope very much that as Iraq progressively stabilizes, we will continue to be able to recommend and see executed further redeployments of U.S. forces. That is absolutely what we know the American people want. It is what the administration wants to see. But it will be based upon a cold-eyed assessment of the situation on the ground, rather than an arbitrary timeline or an arbitrary set of force levels projected into the future. We have been in the Middle East for 60 years. We are going to be staying there for some time to come. But we aren't there solely because of the interests of today, of the interests of any one country, even a country as important and significant as Iraq. We are there for the totality of our interests. Iran looks at the Middle East strategically. Iran doesn't just focus on Iraq. It has its own interests in Iraq, but it also uses Iraq as a point of projecting its influence, projecting its challenge elsewhere. Iran looks at Lebanon, at Syria, at movements such as Hezbollah, radical Palestinians, as other elements of its overall strategic projection of influence, just as it looks at its nuclear weapons program as a means to project its strategic influence. And we have to respond strategically. We have to respond strategically, not just in Iraq, but elsewhere, and we are. We are engaging, and John Duke Anthony, I think, will probably speak to this when he addresses you uh, later this year, with the Gulf Coordination Council plus Jordan and Egypt, the so-called GCC plus two, a body we set up about 13 months ago. Secretary has met, Secretary Gates has joined her for some six meetings now. The purpose of our intense engagement with our friends and allies in the Levant and in the Gulf is not just to help stabilize their area, but to help project a Middle East which is ever more resistant to external forces of violence, radicalization, and subversion from Iran, from Al-Qaeda, and from other similar movements. We're committed to addressing some of the sources capitalized upon by radical movements and states for their own purposes that create instability in the Middle East, polarization in the Middle East. The President is committed to aggressively moving forward the Israel-Palestinian peace process. Later this year, we hope very much that there will be an international meeting that can significantly advance this very difficult conflict's resolution. We're working to demonstrate that our commitment to being in the region for the long haul is not just rhetorical, it's real and it's beyond Iraq. We have committed and we are discussing now with the U.S. Congress a very significant package of arms sales to our key Gulf allies. We have similarly committed to a very significant and long-term continuation of our military assistance to the State of Israel as well as our military assistance and to a lesser degree our economic assistance over the years to come to Egypt. These are all signals, not just to those states, but also to Iran, to other radicals, to Syria. We are not leaving the Middle East. There will be no precipitate withdrawal of U.S. forces because, quite frankly, there is not going to be any precipitate end to our interests in that area or to the challenges we face. We believe, through a strategic approach to the region that encompasses moving forward the situation in Iraq to greater stability and security, through progressively building relationships with our traditional allies and partners elsewhere in the Middle East, through a strategic approach at many levels, international, state to state, entity to entity, with Iran, that U.S. interests can, over the time ahead, be advanced, be advanced significantly, and through that advance, help advance the interests for the long term of our friends and allies, of the people of the Middle East, including the people of Iraq. Thank you very much.
Well, we thank you very much. Um, the floor is open for questions. And the question is how important would, sure. a, would a resolution of the Arab-Israeli conflict be uh, to Iraq and, and other questions? And what are the prospects of uh, some advancement of that cause uh, in Annapolis later? Well, certainly we believe that addressing the issues in the Middle East that are exploited by states and by entities such as al-Qaeda for their own purposes to foment further radicalization, further polarization, uh, are certainly something we want to advance. And the Arab-Israeli, the Palestinian-Israeli peace processes are a key part of that. It stands on its own merits. Certainly there is a strategic advantage to being able to move this long-standing conflict forward to a resolution. It's an advantage for every citizen of the Middle East and certainly for every citizen of the United States. Far too much suffering, far too much heartbreak, far too much violence has afflicted those people, Israel, the Palestinians, the Arabs, over these decades. It should come to an end. And we're committed to do what we can to bring it to an end. But it stands on its own merits. We are doing this because it is right to do it for this issue, for these people. It also is good from a strategic standpoint. What do we think about outcomes? Well, Prime Minister Almert and President Abu Mazen uh, have been discussing in many face-to-face -face, uh, talks just how they wish to move ahead together. And at the end of the day, it is their dialogue, their engagement, that is going to be the test of whether or not progress can be achieved. We certainly hope. Uh, that the international meeting, which is now being contemplated, which the Secretary of State is discussing on this trip, will continue to discuss in her diplomacy here and overseas, uh, can move forward a process that more clearly defines what the political horizon is for Israelis and for Palestinians. But I'm not going to talk here about a specific set of outcomes. That's something that we are working with the parties right now to try to evolve. But we obviously invest quite a bit of importance in this. The energies of the President of the Secretary are very much part of this. Both have said this is a priority for them, uh, as indeed it has to be. The uh, hypothetical question is, what do we do if Turkey goes into uh, uh, Kurdish territory in northern Iraq? And uh, then secondly, uh, how do the people in Iran and Iraq uh, respond to the enormous economic progress that's being made in some small states such as Dubai. Sure. Uh, first, uh, any good speaker uh, declines to comment on hypotheticals, but, and, and so will I. Uh, but, but you ask an important question, and, and let me speak a bit about how we view the situation on the Iraqi or Kurdish regional government Turkish border. We are deeply concerned at the acts of terror which have killed hundreds of innocent Turkish citizens, military and civilians, over the course of the past several years, including well over 100 in this year alone. That's unacceptable. It's further unacceptable that in the territory of a friendly state, of a friendly provincial or regional government, in the case of the Kurds, terrorist groups and elements are able to live to conduct themselves with impunity. That's not acceptable. And we've made that very clear to the government of Iraq and to the Kurdish regional government leadership, who in the first instance must bear responsibility for the presence of the PKK terror organization on their soil. We have expressed to the Turks our deepest sympathy and understanding of the losses that they have suffered to terror, because that's what this is. It has no other justification. Um, we have worked with the Turks as we have worked with the Iraqi government and with the Kurdish regional government to attempt to foster meaningful action against the PKK. We do not want to see a Turkish cross-border operation. We believe that a cross-border operation is intrinsically destabilizing, threatening to broad interests of all states in the region. It should not happen. This is not a green light. It is not an amber light. It's an unyielding red light. But we also understand the magnitude of Turkish loss and the concerns in Turkey at a national level over a continuation of these terror attacks. Something must be done. The Iraqi government has reached out to Turkey. It has recently concluded a counterterrorism accord. It has spoken of the PKK as a terrorist organization in unequivocal terms. The Kurdish leadership in whose territory this group is based must act. They have not acted. 
Much more needs to be done, and this is an issue where we will continue to focus in the time ahead. Uh, you asked the other question about uh, Dubai. Look, what's the lesson of Dubai? Where a private sector friendly, investor friendly government exists that offers modern facilities, a modern backbone for internet and high tech industry to locate itself, a media friendly environment for publishing and broadcasting industry, where broad encouragement to visitors is made, and where the focus is on entrepreneurship and private development, you get extraordinary progress. And the message to any state in the region, it's not just to Iran, it's not just to Iraq, it's to the rest of the Middle East, is this is what can be done as you move beyond hydrocarbons as a source of income into taking advantage, even in a fairly desolate and seemingly inhospitable environment, of natural advantages in terms of place, location, and facilities. Dubai is a success story for Latin America, for East Asia, not just for the Middle East. Would you, would you comment on the, uh, the issue of the admittance of uh, Iraqis who have worked closely with us into the United States uh, when they seek to uh, depart from Iraq? Uh, we do have a significant moral responsibility for those Iraqis who have worked closely with our military, with our civilian elements in that country. They have undergone and they still undergo great risk uh, in their daily lives. Often they cannot tell their families, can't tell their neighbors what they do. They are concerned that as they enter those areas, our bases or the international zone in Baghdad to perform their work, that they will be spotted. Too many of them have been assassinated their family members have been killed or threats of killing have been made against them. Many have been displaced within Iraq, many more have had to leave Iraq. We have, as I said, a moral responsibility to these people. We have a broader responsibility to the wider refugee population in Iraq. And let me say, first of all, that responsibility in its first instance is to mobilize the Iraqi government to reestablish security and stability, to put an end to the forces and the factors which led those communities to leave Iraq and to allow them to return home. No one wishes to see, not the UN High Commissioner for Refugees, not the US government, not the Iraqi government, and not the refugees themselves, primarily in Syria and Jordan. Their displacement from a troubled Iraq turn into a new permanent dislocation of a major refugee population some two million plus strong. That would be a true tragedy for the region as well as for Iraq. They need to come home. And so our first obligation is to ensure that the circumstances are created as rapidly as possible that allow them to come back. But for the most vulnerable refugees, we do have a responsibility. We have been moving, and the we is a collective U.S. government, we, too slowly over the course of the past year and more to address this problem but it is now accelerating at a dramatic pace. We expect that we will bring into the United States at least 12,000 of these refugees and perhaps more over the course of the coming year. Now that seems like a relatively small number, but most of the refugee population in Syria, in Jordan, is not seeking to go to a third country of refuge. They want to go back to Iraq, and that's as it should be. But we are addressing the concerns with the UN High Commissioner for Refugees, who provides the initial processing through close work with the Department of Homeland Security, which has the direct responsibility for the standards of admission to the US, to move as many of the most vulnerable populations as we can, and do it in an exceedingly difficult working environment. The government of Syria does not allow us to have the necessary circuit riders who review these cases come into their country. We continue to knock on the door. We believe it's in Syria's interest to see this processing go on, but so far they have not been willing to yield on this issue. Nevertheless, we will work as aggressively as they can, and I think the American people and the Congress, who are rightly concerned about this issue, will see a tangible record that is significantly better in terms of the management and the admissions of refugees as a whole, as well as specific changes in our ability to protect and to bring, if necessary, to the U.S. Iraqis who have been directly associated with us. Would you uh, comment on the relationship between Russia and Iran, especially as uh, shown in the last few days, 
and how that works into the uh, American policy for the region. Uh, Russia is a key party to any strategic approach to dealing with the threat posed by Iran and by Iran's nuclear program. Uh, and it has been a partner, along with China and the Security Council, in dealing in two successive Chapter 7, that is mandatory, UN Security Council resolutions uh, addressing Iran's challenge to the international community. Uh, we will judge Russia by its performance in the weeks and months ahead as the international community moves next month uh, to what will be, I fear, another confrontation with Iran over Iran's challenge to the international community. We will be awaiting the response of reports uh, from Mohammed al-Baradai, the chair of the International Atomic Energy Agency, from Javier Solana, the chief negotiator on behalf of the critical EU states that are engaged with Iran, to see whether or not Iran is willing to meet the two critical requirements of the international community with respect to its nuclear program, to fully disclose the nature of its programs, not just past programs, but current programs, enrichment programs, and to suspend completely that enrichment. Iran has declined to do either in the past. I cannot tell you that there is enormous optimism that their response will be affirmative this time. If it is not, we are indeed determined with Russia, with China, with the permanent members of the Security Council to go to another Chapter 7 resolution. And with each resolution, the strictures on Iran grow tighter. The impact on the Iranian regime in terms of financial opportunities, commercial opportunities denied, increases. We will do what we need to do unilaterally as the United States, in multilateral fora, in international fora, including the Security Council, with individual states, such as France, with individual institutions in the financial and commercial world, to ensure that it is made clear to the government in Iran that there is a price to be paid for continuing to challenge the will of the international community and the peace of the world. And we very much hope that Russia, by its actions, places itself squarely within that international consensus as it has done in the past. Would you um, comment on your deliberations with respect to a, a diplomatic surge uh, that would be focused uh, essentially at uh, a division of power within uh, the major sectors in Iraq? Well, the speaker opened up with a remark that is absolutely the basis for all of our approach to Iraq. There is no military or security resolution to that country's future. Security is a part of, a critical part of, any ultimate resolution. But there must be an economic, a social, and a diplomatic and political resolution as well. All lines must move forward together. And Dave Petraeus, like George Casey before him, would be the first to tell you. There is, at the end of the day, no force of arms whether it's 160,000 or 500,000 that can bring about a peace. It requires these other areas to move forward as well. And that's where our focus has been, not just on security and stabilization, vital as it is, and it is absolutely essential, but also on how we can help foster a better environment in which services, in which practical political and economic accommodations can be made. They may not rise. They don't rise right now to the level of grand reconciliation. But they're the incubator of reconciliation. They're the essential precursor of a reconciliation. Now, what does reconciliation mean? What is the shape of Iraq as Iraqis see it? Well, there is no common vision today. Ryan Crocker spoke, I think, very bluntly and very eloquently to this. There is no single national vision. There are many visions of what the future of Iraq is to be. Would it help if we were to somehow bring all of Iraq's leaders together in a Dayton-style meeting? Well, you know, we and they have tried a series of such meetings. But because of the dissonance between fundamental visions of what the country is to be, it's very difficult to move beyond rhetorical pledges of progress to actually seeing progress achieved. And so what we're doing now is we're working on many levels. It, in a Tolstoyan reference, we are more the fox than the hedgehog. 
we see a great many things. Our policy attempts to be as agile and as flexible as we can. We work on areas of progress at a local level outside Baghdad where we see promise, as in Anbar and elsewhere. We work with the national government as we see progress there. We don't have a single point in Baghdad with the central government of success or failure. Instead, we are attempting to construct many points of success, but it is a progressive process and it will take time. I don't know what shape Iraq's leaders will ultimately wish to see their country assume. It will be a federal state. I think that's very clear by their own will. But federal means a great many things in its application around the world, from very centralized states to very decentralized states. But I take courage and have, even over the worst years of Iraq's violence and misery, in a very interesting Iraqi self-identification. When Iraqis are asked, and this has been true for the past three years, anywhere in the country, Sunni, Shia, Kurds, in Baghdad, in Anbar, in the Kurdish region, in the south, what do you identify yourself as? And they're given a number of different descriptors. Iraqis, Sunni, Shia, Kurd, Arab, Iranian, tribal, family. They put Iraqi first, and first by a large margin. That is not what you would see if you were to poll Lebanese today on how they identify themselves. Lebanese would come down third or fourth on that list of identifiers. But Iraqis see themselves as Iraqis first, and only secondarily and at a great distance as Sunnis or Shia, Arabs or non-Arabs. And that, I think, is encouraging. There has been much talk in the US Congress, in think tanks, about partitions, soft or hard, of Iraq. Well, the basic question is, what do Iraqis want? Do Iraqis want to live in disparate states? And their answer, universally, is no. They want an equitable distribution of resources. This is a contest for power, for resources, for authority, but it's a contest within the boundaries of a single country. And while we don't know the ultimate resolution that Iraqis will reach regarding their country, we do know this, that if this slow process of reconciling the revolutionary dynamics at play in Iraq today unleashed by, after all, the overturning of 30 years of one of the most controlling and repulsive dictatorships in the world, which itself had followed hundreds of years of either internal or external dictatorship and control, whether by local tyrants or external suzerains. Whatever the direction that takes, it will take a better direction from the standpoint of US interests the interests of our friends in the region, and we think of Iraqis themselves, if it can take place in an environment of greater stability and security, of lessened interference from forces of radicalism, polarization, violence, and terror from inside or outside than if the opposite is true. While we do not know the ultimate destination point, the landing point of Iraq's political process, we do know with certainty what will happen if violence, if extremism, if polarization and terror become the backdrop against which that evolution takes place, and it will not be a result that in any way serves the interests of the United States today, tomorrow, or in the future. The ultimate hypothetical, <laughs> extract oil from the Middle East and, and what happens? And, and, and other, also implied, though, was that if we can get freer from uh, uh, energy dependence in some way or another, how can that ameliorate the situation? Well, in the eloquent words of Shimon Perez, if my grandmother had wheels, she'd be a bus. <laughs> we, <laughs> we, we deal with the world we have. We deal with the world that has evolved over the course of the past half century and more. And we deal with it in a manner that reflects the totality, not just of our interests, not just the interests of our friends and partners around the world, because this is far bigger than the Middle East, but of a global integrated trading and oil consuming community. Wishing doesn't make things so. What we can do, though, is approach sources of instability and violence, sources short term and long term of polarization, 
to build more inclusive rather than exclusive societies, polities, and economic systems in the Middle East and elsewhere. So that oil being what it is, oil being what it might be in the future, it's just one factor among many in a region which has suffered under torment internal and external for so long, its people merit a different kind of future. And it's a future we think that they can have. It's not oil that drives this. It's a desire to see long-term, genuine stability, not just status quo, in an area that is so important to the U.S. for so many different reasons. How big a problem is Pakistan, um, if it is? And how do we deal with al-Qaeda in the uh, uh, western uh, provinces of, or, or areas of Pakistan? Well, the presence of Taliban elements of al-Qaeda in areas of the northwest frontier along the Afghan-Pakistani border are of critical concern to the United States. They're of critical concern to the government of Pakistan. The government of Pakistan has been an absolutely essential partner in this conflict, the conflict in Afghanistan, the desire to prevent the Taliban from reasserting its domination in areas of that country, as well as the broader struggle against al-Qaeda. And that's a partnership that needs to be sustained. At the same time, Pakistan also needs to move forward as a state in a manner of greater openness, greater democratization. We would note that former Prime Minister Benazir Bhutto will be returning to Pakistan in the very near future. That's a positive step. We want to see a more open political system and process in Pakistan. We want to see the will of the Pakistani people reflected in their government. And we're encouraged by developments in that direction including Benazir Bhutto's return. But the criticality of Pakistan and the efforts undertaken by its government and its armed forces vis-a-vis -vis these radical elements, Taliban, Al-Qaeda, is essential today and it is going to remain essential to the U.S. and our interests for the future. The, uh, would you spell out our overall strategy toward Al-Qaeda, if you could? <laughs> and. Uh, and then the, the sub-question is, uh, when you mentioned that, did you mean uh, al-Qaeda, comma, uh, Taliban, or did you mean to equal the two in commenting upon their presence in... Uh, to take the last verse, they're two separate entities, but they both walk like ducks, and the consequence of their actions is very similar. It is misery, suffering, death, violence, terror. And so they are two different organizations but they have share a very common ideological view. And when they have been able to establish control, they have done very much the same things to the populations that have lived under their torment. Now, with respect to the global campaign against al-Qaeda, uh, this is an easy one to answer. This is the long war. This is a global campaign against a force of terror which is based in all parts of the world, in North America, in Latin America, in Europe, Africa, Asia, East Asia, the Pacific, which has an ideological bent that is fundamentally hostile, not just to us, not even just to the West, as it is often characterized, but to basically any system of governance other than their own vision of a reestablished extreme Islamist caliphate, a bizarre vision which has been condemned by leading Islamic clerics around the world. That's a struggle that is not going to end tomorrow or next year or the year after that. It's a long-term process, and it involves a multitude of assets, entities, a multitude of partners. It's a global war, not just by the United States, but virtually every country on Earth, because almost every country in the world, in every continent of the world, literally, has been touched by al-Qaeda's violence and terror. And so it's something in which we believe all countries need to enlist, but it is a long campaign. How do you measure success in, in Iraq in particular? It's a very good question. We don't believe you measure it by an exclusive set of benchmarks that focus on a particular set of actions taken at a national level. They're important, but they can't be the sole focal point. They can't be the sole criteria. You can't measure success by a specific timetable or ticking out of a clock. That doesn't work either. 
Success, I think, is not determined by have we reached X level of violence versus Y level of violence, and thus that is something we're going to declare victory over. It's different than that. Success is progressively reduced levels of violence that allow progressively greater security and stability manifest not in abstract numbers or graphs or charts that track civilian casualties or numbers of attacks. It's something else. What's happening on the ground? Are Iraqis able to resume more normal lives? Are the institutions of local and national government better able to function and to provide support for the Iraqi people? Is there the beginning of a process that really can be called national reconciliation? Is there the beginning of a process in which, over time, the evolution of a common Iraqi national vision, what former Ambassador Khalilzad used to call a national compact, can that be evolved? Do you see signs that it is moving? All of that and a hundred other things constitute success. And very often, I'll steal a phrase again from Ryan Crocker in his testimony in September, very often we don't know the cumulative impact of what has been going on these many lines of operation that we and Iraqis and others are embarked upon until we look back and we can assess trends. We often can't see it as it's happening. It's only in retrospect that we realize what was happening at the end, the very end of 2006 and through 2007. It wasn't always clear. Sometimes it wasn't clear at all while it was going on. Success has a complex definition. It reflects all of these things. We do believe success in a progressive sense in Iraq, which is not tomorrow we wake up and it's victory, but progressive sense of improving circumstances in Iraq, which permit a progressive drawdown of U.S. forces, a progressive assumption of Iraqi responsibility for their country, their lives, their security, their economy, their people, that that can indeed take place. Thank you. Let me just add to the general appreciation and, and say that I think we're particularly grateful for, uh, for laying out so clearly the structure of the administration's uh, view in Iraq and uh, uh, the decent motives that are associated with it and its, its aspirations. I think it was a, a very interesting, as I say, presentation of that structure. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. Thank you all.